He rules the world with a staff and a rod. We're a team, me and God. Good morning, brothers and sisters. What I'm going to attempt to do with the help of the Holy Spirit in this lesson is try to get the year of our Lord's return and our resurrection to get it within a few years. To get, I guess you can call it a window. A lot of Christians will say, there's no way. There is no way you can do that, brother. I don't care if you studied the Bible 10,000 hours. You couldn't come up with a, an approximate uh, window of, say, a few years of when our Lord's going to return. Well, we are instructed to try. We are instructed to watch. We are instructed to eagerly await the kingdom in such a manner as you can't help but pick up the Holy Word every single day. So, if you don't even understand that, then, then don't get in my way, brothers and sisters. You need to be doing this too. Now, once we come up with this window of our Lord's return, we should not try to state, well, I'm positive the Holy Spirit gave me this and this is the window. No! No! This is supposed to be fun. This is supposed to be entertainment. What do you mean, brother? There is, this is supposed to be your number one form of entertainment. Sitting around, reading the letter from your fiancé about his return. This whole Bible are letters from your fiancé. Okay, even before he became a, a human being and born a woman, even before that he was writing you letters. You're supposed to eagerly await the kingdom. There are clues on every single page of this Bible of when he is returning and in what manner he's going to return and the reason for his return and then what's going to happen after his return. It's all in here. Does anyone know the exact day and hour of his return except Father? No. But he worded it just like that, the exact day and hour for a reason, because you could figure out everything else, just about. That doesn't mean I've got it all figured out, but it's fun to try, and you should be watching. This should be, uh, the Spirit should watch and witness you talking to other Christians about this every single day. And it will be put into the Book of Remembrance. Have you ever heard of the Book of Remembrance? Um, Father takes notice when you talk to others about the return of his son to set up the kingdom of God. He takes notice. When's the last time you sparked a conversation with another Christian in regards to the return of Christ and the setting up of the kingdom of God? Have you ever sparked a conversation about that? Or are you one of those who never talk about the coming kingdom? Occasionally, on Sunday mornings, you might mention the name of Jesus and sing a couple songs to him and say a prayer, and then you do it again the following Sunday. If you're thinking about your retirement, your kid's college, you need to be thinking about your Lord's return. If you were someone who read Father's Word every day, and brothers and sisters, I'm not judging you, because I would not be doing this every day unless he gave me the desire. So it's nothing that I should boast about because I like to read the Bible. Because I'm getting old, getting lazy, I like to sit in the air conditioning in a nice comfortable chair and read Father's Word. No, this is a desire that he's given me for whatever reason. And uh, you should be praying that he gives you the desire now, having said all that, um, I know, the. I'm pretty sure, we'll see how I word that, I'm pretty sure I know the month of our Lord's return. It's a month that no one is talking about. It's not uh, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Trumpets, it's not Passover. When is it? Well, the book of Isaiah says that the Lord's going to return to cut down the abominable branches couple weeks before the grapes are fully ripe at the annual grape harvest in Israel. Well, is that his second coming? Yes. When he returns 
to rebuke and chase the enemy out of the land so he can set up the kingdom that's those are the abominable branches okay uh, Jew and Gentile but a lot of times when he's talking about the abominable branches he's talking about the um, scribes Pharisees and hypocrites remember Matthew chapter 23 a whole chapter um, devoted towards the abominable branches that are found in the land of Israel that he's gonna come back and repay them remember the ones that pulled out his beard sucker punched him put him on the cross tortured him he's coming back for them well haven't they already passed on yes and they'll have their part in, in the burning lake of fire and brimstone they'll be brought back to life to see what it's like to live in a glorified body face judgment at great white throne judgment and then they're gonna have their part in the fire now well again <laughs> focusing on this lesson we are going to attempt to make a window of the year of our Lord's return. Now, once you understand the scripture that I have in front of you right now, once you've noticed it, once you understand it, you'll realize that it's there for a reason. For those who are willing to spend enough time with their fiance to stay awake in the garden, to stay awake, to be with him during that last watch. I say again, to stay awake and be with him during that last watch so, the, so that day does not take you as a thief because you listen to the midnight cry. In fact, you're the one giving the midnight cry. Watch, keep your garment. There's a deception coming on this planet that you cannot imagine. He, the Antichrist, small h, will be very, very convincing. You need to know the manner in which your Lord returns. You need to understand who comes first, the fake Jesus or the real Jesus. You need to know these things. Your children need to know these things. Why do they know these things? Because you talk about them all the time. And hopefully, eventually, they'll take a few moments and listen to you. Right here, one of the most important verses of the entire Bible in regards to our Lord's return, your fiancé, who's away, who's about to come back, and to see if you've been faithful. Hosea chapter 6 especially verse 2. I'm going to start reading from verse 1. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he is torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth. His going forth on the day of his return. In other words, the day that Father says, Now it is done. Go, Jesus. Go forth and receive your bride. The going forth isn't the day he was born of Mary. The going forth is the day he returns. It is established as the morning. He will come to us like the latter rain and former rain to the earth. Now, chapter 6, verse 2 is what we're focusing on. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. Remember those two verses in the Bible that say a day is as a thousand years to the Lord? I'm not going to turn to that now. I know of at least two of them. Well, after two thousand years from his ascension, he will revive us on the third day. On the third day. Now, does it say on the beginning of the third day? 
It says on the third day he will raise us up. He has told us from the beginning that he would be gone 2,000 years. Watch number one and watch number two. Did they understand that a thousand years ago? No. But us living in the last days should understand that, especially when you watch television. You understand it now. It should be coming together. Okay? Father established from the beginning when he was bringing Jesus back. He has a plan. Learn the character and the personality of your Creator, your Heavenly Father. He wants to be known by you. He wants to know you. He wants to sojourn this earth with you. He wants to walk it with you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He said in the last days, you could read it in Daniel chapter 11, that there are going to be people who are giving understanding. They will be called the people of understanding, and they will instruct many in the last days. What are some of the things that will be understood? This verse right here, verse 2 of Hosea chapter 6. So now, hopefully brothers and sisters, right now you're getting real excited going, okay, 2,000 years from what? Well, my guess is from the time he left us. He said, I won't leave you orphans. I'll send you the Holy Spirit. He's saying, I'm going to leave you, and I'm coming back in 2,000 years. Now the problem is, we do not know the exact year and month and day that he ascended to heaven to make a place for his bride. Now when he says, I'm making a place for you, he's talking about eternity. He is not talking about the 1,000 years of his reign, the kingdom of God, on earth which ends with him putting all enemies under his feet when he hands the keys to the kingdom to father and then the new jerusalem which is a city with a roof there'll be no sun no moon the lord will be our light inside that structure it's going to be huge will it be on this earth will it be on a new earth i don't know But getting back to this verse, when did, when was Jesus born? And more importantly, when did he ascend to heaven? Because he's coming back according to uh, the word of God. His going forth is established. It is established. Going forth, again, is not his birth. Going forth is his coming back. To do what? To heal us and to bind us up why because he has torn us when does jesus our lord tear us well you read all throughout scripture the day of the lord the 42 month period is a day of vengeance by our lord on israel he whistles for the fly and the bee to come all of the Islamic jihadists throughout the Middle East and Northern and Central Africa he whistles for them you can read all about that I think it's in Isaiah 7 we'll probably take a look at it he whistles for them the flood of jihad comes against Israel after the caliphate turns into a beast kingdom they attack the rushing of many nations with the sound of the rushing of many waters a flood on Israel its father's doing he will use them as his rod of indignation so he is going to tear Israel apart but his going forth to come back to heal to bind up that's going that's already determined by father and he tells you it's going to happen after 2000 days then you get revived. Then you get your healing. He's going to raise you from the dead. Now is he going to raise all Israel from the dead and judge them at that time? I don't know for sure. 
Sometimes I think not. And then I read some scripture like Daniel 12, and then I wonder. But we do know that all in Christ are going to be raised from the dead on that day, and those of us left alive will join them on that sea of glass above the supercell storm cloud tornado that Jesus returns on. Have you ever heard that before? Where does he return to? The wedding hall. You read all about it in Matthew 22 in the book of Revelation, chapter 16. The wedding hall is the valley of Armageddon. It says here his going forth to return to earth is established as the morning. In other words, it's going to happen just like the sun comes up every morning. His return is going to happen. And it's scheduled. And it's locked in. If you knew, I mean, it's locked in as much as our rotation around the sun. It's a locked in scheduled date. That would take a miracle to change. He will come to us like the rain. I mean, there are clues all throughout the Bible. That means something. He will come to us like the rain. Well, where do the rains come from? The clouds. Will Jesus appear in the clouds? Yes, he will. Above the wedding hall, the valley of Armageddon. What about all the verses that say Jesus and his bride and his angels, his entire army, will arrive over Jerusalem at evening time? I know of three verses that say we will arrive on that storm cloud to defend Jerusalem over Jerusalem at twilight. Psalm 90, Isaiah 17, 14, Zechariah 14, 7. They all say we'll arrive over Jerusalem at twilight. But the Valley of Armageddon is not Jerusalem. The, the, excuse me, the wedding hall is not Jerusalem. It's the Valley of Armageddon further north. Okay, right, the land, all, the valley, all around the hill of Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, where many wars have been fought over the years. So, 2,000 years he's coming back from when he ascended. Let's try to figure out when Jesus was born, how long was his ministry, try to get an idea for if we can come close to what year he died and ascended and count 2,000 years let's see what we come up with this should be more entertaining than any book you've ever read than any movie you've ever watched if you really really believe this stuff and how he's getting ready to come back and raise your parents your grandpa your great-grandpa from the dead and you're going to be snatched up in the twinkling of an eye, and you're going to be riding that storm cloud on the sea of glass, singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, if you really believe that, and if preachers quit telling you, no need to study that stuff, my child, because he didn't tell us those things. We're supposed to just always be ready and enjoy your life and think of plan retirement and, and worry about your career. No! You get up every day trying to figure out when he's coming and it's and you're so excited about it, that's all you want to talk about. Those are the ones who are in Christ. Think about it, brothers. What do you focus on? Who is your lover? Who do you love more than anything? Who do you the one you love more than anything is what you think about? the most minutes of the day. Think about that today or tomorrow. Go, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to figure out what I think about more during the course of my day. Are you thinking about the Bible? The Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Lord Jesus? Are you thinking about pleasing your boss? Are you thinking about, I gotta get a promotion because my wife wants a new car? What is on your mind the most of every day? That is the Lord that you serve. 
Well, brother, that's some that's some tough language there. Yes, it is. You need to step back. You need to go sit in that comfortable chair in the air conditioning and ponder who your Lord is. Mine's coming back very soon. Very soon. To give me that bow of bronze you read about in Psalm 18. I will be a volunteer, Psalm 110, to defend Israel, to defend the city of Jerusalem. I will be given wings like eagles. Renewed strength. I will never die. And if I remain alive until his coming, I will never taste death. I will live forever. Do you believe this stuff? I do. And it makes me smile. All right, here we go. Let's look at some scriptures and find out when he's come back for us. Your, I mean, your very first day when he comes back, you're a soldier. Whether you want to be a soldier or not, you're a soldier in the Lord's army. And I'm not talking about being a missionary while he's still away and trying to win souls to Christ. I'm talking about a real soldier on the day of his return. You need to get into Father's Word. There's visions of you in your glide body flying around over Jerusalem defending it. You should read those verses. And don't let anyone or a preacher tell you that's symbolism. That's symbolism. No, it's not. What about the hundred times that Israel had to face an enemy that was in their land Land, a father made a decree. This is my people. This is my land. I want you to go take it from the enemy. And I want you, with my help, we'll work together and you will kill hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds of thousands of them. This is the character of your Lord. He could have said, Go hide, and then you're going to find a lot of dead bodies in the morning, and I need you to get your burial crews together. Because I've got a work I've got to do. Sometimes he did that. And then a lot of times he said, go sharpen your swords. Sometimes he turned the enemy on themselves. Sometimes he just spoke the word. The sword of his mouth came out and they fell dead instantaneously. And then there's other times where he said, I'm going to let you go. You're going to lose some, some, some members. You're going to die in battle, but you're going to be victorious. I don't wish these things to happen, but when we come back, we are in our that day, that night, by morning, and Christ is no more. Is Jesus going to speak the plague over Jerusalem that you read about in Zechariah 14, 12? Just like the one in Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes, he is. But you're hand, being handed a bow of bronze for a reason. You're going to be breaking to pieces the enemies as you swoop down onto their shoulders. You should read Father's letters to you about what it's going to be like when he returns, when Jesus returns. You should read it. Well, that just sounds all symbolic, and it just confuses me, and some of it's kind of scary, so I don't think I'll read it. I think you should. Don't you want to know what's going to happen? Well, I ain't got nothing against them Muslims. It's got nothing to do with that, brothers. There are souls. All souls were created before the foundations of the earth. You need to read Galatians 3 and 4, Ephesians chapter 1, and so many other chapters in the Bible. Your soul was either born of the free woman or born of the bond woman. You have been, the potter has made the clay, you, either into a vessel of honor or dishonor. Who are you to tell the potter what to do with the clay? He chose you. You did not choose him because you're so smart. Yeah, I see ten different gods, I choose that one. 
No, brothers and sisters, he chose you before the foundations of the earth. Then, eventually, he puts you into a human body so you can manifest. So that soul that you were before the foundations of the earth can be manifested into what it was meant to become. That popcorn seed is going to become popcorn. You're going to be manifested into what you were meant to become. It's Father's plan. Who are you to tell him, why did you make the vessels of dishonor? He has a plan. You don't know what you like as a soul before you were placed into a physical, living, man-of-dust body. You may have not been all that pleasing to Father. Maybe you rebelled. Well, does that mean it's all predetermined on whether I'm saved or not, so I don't have to worry about it? No. No. If you come to the realization that the Holy Word is the only truth on the entire planet, if you come to that realization and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, because Jesus has baptized you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, because you love him, you believe that he died and, and rose again and shed his blood to cover your sins, if you believe all of that stuff, then you are a vessel of mercy, a vessel of honor. You were a soul that came from the free woman and that you realize that, that Father is spirit, but he's real. He manifests things into the physical realm and that he is the creator of the universe and that he loves you and you love him and you love the brethren then you are the chosen one or the chosen ones I guess I should say Jesus obviously is the chosen one now getting back to what we're doing in this lesson let's take a look at Matthew chapter 2 We're going to look at verses 13 through 23 of Matthew chapter 2. We're beginning our understanding of when Jesus was born and, and try to figure out what year he died. A lot of people have tried this, and I'm not saying we're going to be able to do anything conclusive, but we're going to have a window. We're going to come up with a time frame window. All right, Matthew chapter 2, we're going to read verses 13 to the end of the chapter, verse 23. There's more than one King Herod in all of this. Did you realize that? There are two King Herods and we're going to uh, get a really good understanding of who they are and what time periods they lived in because it has a lot to do with when your Lord was born and when he died and we know that he's coming back 2,000 years later to heal us and to bind us especially Israel and Jerusalem. So Verse 13 of chapter 2, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child Jesus and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod, this is the first Herod, will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. So what have we learned so far? We're not even done with chapter 2 yet. King Herod makes that decree that you're getting ready to read about in verse, what is it, 16? So Jesus is born... King Herod hears all the rumors. He's going to make the decree. And Joseph and Mary with their child flees to Egypt. Let's see if we can figure out how many years they were in Egypt before they return. So continuing on, verse 14, When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night 
and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, who were warned, and fled a different way out of the country, was exceedingly angry. This first King Herod was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children of what districts who were in Bethlehem and all its districts. So the whole Bethlehem area from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise men then was fulfilled what spoken of by Jeremiah the prophet saying a voice was heard in Ramah Lamentations, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. See, even Jeremiah foretold of this thing that King Herod was decreeing. According to the time which had been determined from the wise men. So he didn't waste any time, King Herod. The first King Herod didn't waste any time making this decree. So we're talking within weeks this decree had gone out from the time Jesus was born. Probably no more than one or two weeks. Jesus goes to Egypt. For how long? See, do I need to read the rest of... Now you can read verses 19 through 23. You can read that yourself. All right. So we know that King Herod, the first one, is still alive. And I say that because once you determine what year the first King Herod died, then you know that Jesus was born before that. In fact, what we're going to see in these scriptures is that Jesus was in Egypt three and a half years. Then King Herod dies. So King Herod dies three and a half years after he makes the decree to kill all the babies in the Bethlehem districts. So once you know what year King Herod died, you can come pretty close to the time of Jesus' birth. All right, let's go to uh, let's go to Luke <coughs> chapters two and chapters three. What do I want to point out here? Well, let's start out. I wanted, uh, have you ever heard of the sign of Revelation chapter 12? We're going to look at that in a second. But here in Luke chapter 2, verse 34, it talks about the Revelation 12 sign. Behold, this child, Jesus, is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. We're actually talking about their souls destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. You see that in Daniel chapter 12. Some of the seed of Jacob will rise to their inheritance. Some of the seed of uh, Jacob, or I should say many, will be judged and not be permitted to spend eternity with father and son and will have their part in the lake of fire those are the ones born of the bond woman but those born of the free woman talking about their souls before the foundations of the world will manifest into what they were meant to become and be part of the elect the chosen the bride but here's the sign Jesus is the sign. You could also read about it in Isaiah 7. Uh, then it you know, goes on talking about Jesus as, as he's growing up and how he's in the temple found by his mother and father. Uh, how long was Jesus missing? Have you ever noticed that? How long Jesus was missing when he was 12 years old? Look here in verse 46 of chapter 2. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple. 
Is that a coincidence? After three days they found him in the temple. What happens in regards to our future after three days? Well, we know we are raised on the third day, which is the start of the millennium. Jesus is gone 2,000 years, two days. He comes back on the third day. I'd like to think of it as the start of the third day, which would be uh, 2,000 years after his ascension, starting the millennium. But after the millennium, he will be found again in the temple of the New Jerusalem. I think that's what that's pointing to there. Now, pay attention to Luke chapter 3, verses, verse 1. Luke chapter 3 helps explain to you uh, who the second King Herod is. Because the first King Herod died when Jesus was around the age of three and a half. I'll show you in Revelation 12 that it, where it says that Jesus was three and a half years in Egypt before the angel of the Lord told him it was safe to go back because King Herod the first had died. Now, if you read this, the first verse of Luke chapter 3, this second King Herod is given the title of Tetrarch of Galilee. When you Google King Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee, you learn that he is the son of Herod the Great, the first King Herod involved in this. So his father died when Jesus was three and a half. His evil father was the one that killed all the babies in the Bethlehem districts that were two years of old or younger. This is his son. All right. And he is given the title of the Tetrarch of Galilee. When you Google it, you find out that Herod the Great, this is very important, wake up. Herod the Great, the first one, that died when Jesus was the age of three and a half, which I'm getting ready to show you in Revelation 12, died in 4 BC. 90% of all historians believe that the first Herod, Herod the Great, this guy's father, died in 4 BC. The other 10% believe 1 BC. I don't know who's right, but the vast majority says 4 BC. If they are correct, then that would put Jesus' birth somewhere between 7 to 8 BC. Wouldn't you agree? Do you see how I got that? King Herod, Herod the Great, dies 4 BC, if they're, if they're correct. Jesus was three and a half years old when he died. I'll show you that in Revelation 12. Jesus was born between 7 and 8 BC. How long was his ministry? His ministry was three and a half years. How old was Jesus when he began his ministry? Well, look right here in Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, and you could just read on and on. Okay. Pretty cool what happens right before that. That's when he's baptized by John the Baptist. And the dove comes upon his shoulder, and the voice from heaven said, You are my beloved son, and in you I am well pleased. Amen. So what do we got so far? Jesus is born, it looks like, good chance, between 7 and 8 BC. And he's about 33 and a half years old when he dies. Hmm. We'll break out some paper and try to do a little bit of math here in a second. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. To try to get some proof on how long baby Jesus was in Egypt before King Herod died in 4 BC. So, Revelation 12. Uh, let's read Revelation 12, verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. 
the woman and her child. This is Mary and Jesus. This is what they this represents. Remember, we saw already that Jesus is the sign given to Israel. All right. This is talking about the sign of Revelation 12. And it tells us that they fled into the wilderness of Egypt for three and a half years. 1,260 days, 42 months, which is also so the length of the, um, not going to say the day of the Lord, it's the 42 month period in the latter days, the second half of the tribulation. It's not all the second half, but it's the 42 month period. Authority is the period where the authority was given by Father to Lucifer to overcome the saints. He was given the authority by Father. All right, to abuse Israel, to abuse Christians. All right, 42 months, and then the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the authority will be taken away from Lucifer. But that will not be the end. That will not be the last day of the age. The blowing of the seventh trumpet is not the last day of the age. The last day of the age comes 45 days following the seventh trumpet. We learn that in Daniel chapter 12. That's the day you arise to your inheritance with Daniel. Why is the 45 days needed? Because of the sixth bowl. Read it. All of the invited guests of Matthew 22 must make their way to the wedding hall, bad and good, for the big revealing of Jesus Christ and his bride. Forty-five days later, day 1,335 from the abomination and desolation that takes place at the fifth seal, and the way that we know that it takes place at the fifth seal of the book of Revelation chapter 6 is because what we read in Daniel 11. The persecution of the Christians occurs at the time the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple. That's the fifth seal when he exalts himself as high as the prince of hosts. You read about in, uh, I think it's Daniel 7. Uh, and then he goes back into the temple 30 days later and exalts himself as high as the God of gods. You can read all that in Daniel 11. It explains there is a time gap between the first time he goes into the temple versus the second time he goes into the temple 30 days later. See my timeline. Um, but we're here to learn the length of time that Jesus and his mother and father are in Egypt in hiding from uh, Herod the Great, the first King Herod. Three and a half years. Again, King Herod, Herod the Great, the first King Herod, dies at 4 BC according to all horse oh, 90 percent of historians are they correct i have no idea they say they are i don't know again that would put jesus's birth around 7 bc or 8 bc i like the number seven how about you now he begins his ministry at age 30 give or take a week or two he is in ministry for 1260 days comment correct me if I'm wrong now let's do the math <laughs> that's scary I'm sure my daughter would get a kick out of hearing me say that let's do the math let's get a piece of paper and see what scribbles the scribbles of a madman that's me let's see what we can come up with hopefully this camera will focus a little bit and not drive us too crazy Brothers and sisters, I need your help. My old pre-calculus days are over. If I can, uh, if I can count to ten, I'd be lucky. All right, so let's. Uh, we probably need to start by remembering. Sorry for the out-of-focus camera. We probably need to remember that we've got BC and we've got AD, but we've also got something called zero AD. What's my point? When we go from B.C. to A.D., we probably need to subtract a year. I'm interested in your comments. So, let's put Jesus' birth. I'm going to call it 7.5 B.C. Right? we got to throw a number down, so I'm going to start with that number. Do you remember why? King Herod supposedly dies in 4 B.C. 
That's when uh, the angel of the Lord went to Joseph and Mary and said, Hey, it's safe now. Come on back. Three and a half years later after they had left Bethlehem. Now they're going to be going and settling down in Galilee in Nazareth. So let's put 7.5 B.C. as the time that Jesus uh, was born. How old was he when he died? Thirty-three and a half years old. So let's take 7.5 BC and add 33.5 years to it equals what year in the AD? Focus grasshopper, focus. That's right. We got only the best in this studio. It's not going to focus. All right, 7.5 BC to 33.5 years equals. I had to think about that for a minute. 26 AD. My peanut sized brain comes up with 26 AD. Did I do it correct? Now, did we subtract a year due to the fact that there's really no such thing as 0 AD? Well, let's subtract a year. 26 AD minus 1 year equals 25 AD. How's that? The year of our Lord's crucifixion and ascension. Okay. Now, what about those other 10% of historians that say Herod the Great actually died in 1 BC? They swear that they figured it out. There's only 10% of them, of all historians, but they think he died in 1 BC. And Jesus was born three and a half years before 1 BC. So if they're right, we'll say 4.5 BC for a time of Jesus' birth. If they are correct, add 33.5 years. What year, what AD year do we come to? Well, 29 A.D. D.D.? <laughs> D-Day? A.D. Alright, 29 A.D. Did we subtract our year yet? No, let's subtract our year. Just like when you're using the Stellarium.org program, which I highly recommend, you've got to keep that uh, in mind, that you've got to subtract a year. So 29 A.D. minus one year equals 29. I just had to look at my notes because something didn't sound correct. All right. 26 A.D. Did I do something wrong here, folks? No. No, I think we're good. So what do we got as far as a year of our Lord's crucifixion and ascension? We're looking at a window of 25 A.D. and 28 A.D., a three-year period. Based on the differences between the historian's account of when the first King Herod, Herod the Great, died. So any questions so far? So, he either died in 4 B.C. or 1 B.C., and Jesus was born three and a half years before his death. Remember, this is not, I uh, can't swear by these dates. I'm just doing the best job I can, brothers and sisters. And keeping Hosea chapter 6, verse 2 in mind. Because the Lord may have meant what he said. How's that for a 
wording it just right. What if the Lord actually meant what he said about, I'm going to raise you from the dead in two days? Or after two days, I'm going to raise you from the dead. What if he meant what he said in Hosea 6 2? Well, let's add 2,000 years to these dates. What if he meant what he said? The window would be 2025 to 2028. I call it a window. Historians would probably say one of these two is correct. They probably wouldn't consider it a window. But that's pretty interesting. Do we have any special cosmic events that our NASA says is scheduled to occur either in Israel or the Islamic world? Anything extra, extra special in this time frame? Well, I do know of one event that happens in on 2 August 2027 that's pretty interesting. I just I'm not making any dates. I'm just throwing it out there. It's something that's pretty pretty cool that you might want to know about. Mecca, okay? Mecca will be in complete 100% totality. I don't mean just uh a solar eclipse I'm talking they're in the zone of totality for that solar eclipse on 2 August 2027 2027 2 August Mecca will be in totality we know that the ten horns turn on the seven beast cities that make up the beast kingdom upon Jesus' arrival do we not? Is that fact? Yes, it is. Doesn't mean it's going to happen on that date, but the ten horns do realize their mistake upon Jesus' return and turn on the seven beast cities. The Bible says, Jeremiah 49 verse 38 says that the Lord is going to take control of Iran's military and destroy the beast kings and princes from Iran. Now does that just simply mean a military army leaves Iran and goes to Baghdad and Mosul and other places and defeats them? Maybe. But when you look at all of the verses in the Bible that say the beast cities will be desolate forever and ever and ever and will never ever be inhabited by life forms again, have you ever read those verses? It names the beast cities. I'll just give you a few of them. Amman, Jordan, Baghdad, Mosul, Mecca, Tyre, Lebanon. There's others. They're listed in the Bible. The nations surrounding Israel that come against Israel. The beast cities. So I think Iran, ancient Elam, is one of the ten horns that turn against the seven beast cities upon Jesus' arrival. Due to the fact that these cities are never, ever, ever inhabited by life forms again, that sounds like nuclear radiation to me. Now, having known that, you go look at the first four verses of Zechariah chapter 5, and it talks about the curse that will live inside the structures for many years and make them desolate. That sounds like radiation to me, wandering around inside the houses the house of the Antichrist and the house of the one who swears falsely by his name, the false prophet. Sounds like nuclear radiation to me. Now, what about what happens in Jerusalem at the return of the Lord? When him and his bride, that's us, is defending Jerusalem and Israel and chasing the enemy out of the land and killing them. What about the curse of Zechariah 14? Uh, chapter 14, verse 12, it says that Jesus will destroy them who come against Israel with the sword of his mouth as he's defending Jerusalem. That is not nuclear radi radiation. That's just like what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. Read Zechariah 14, 12. That's the plague. 
with Zechariah 5 is the curse of radiation coming from Elam. Did you know this kind of stuff is in God's Word about your future in just a few years? You'll spend all this time watching Wolf Blitzer, but you won't get into the Word that your Father says, I'm telling you all things. But you won't spend any time in it. So, just wanted to point that out to you, 2 August 2, 2027. Just something to keep in the back of your mind. I guess more importantly, though, are these dates. These dates, these years, 2025, 2028, which are possibly 2,000 years after our Lord's death and ascension. He said, I'll be back to heal you, to bind up your wounds that I'm going to afflict on you. Okay, maybe he's just talking about Israel, but that's okay. That still gives us our focus, our timeline. I'll see you in 2,000 years. I'm going to have my vengeance on you, my rod of indignation, but then I'm going to raise you from the dead and put band-aids on all your wounds, and you'll never cry again. When? After two days. A day with the Lord is a 1,000 years. Behold, I have foretold you all things. Those who will watch and keep oil in their lamps and listen and heed the midnight cry. And if I catch you talking to other Christians eagerly awaiting the kingdom of God, I will put you in the book of remembrance. Thus saith the Lord. All right. We'll end this by saying, all right, seven-year tribulation. I, there's no doubt in my mind, and I am nobody. Believe me, I am nobody. Peace-sized brain, remember? I am sure that Jesus returns on the last day of the age. That's when we're caught up to join him in the clouds, that great storm cloud, supercell, that's going to form above the wedding hall and then work its way down. By twilight, it'll be over Jerusalem. Ark of the Covenant will be seen above the storm cloud, flashing in the in the, the, the lightning flashes will illuminate the Ark of the Covenant vision. Revelation eleven nineteen, Matthew chapter twenty four talks about the sign of the Son of Man that appears just before Jesus comes back. There's verses in Isaiah fifty nine and sixty that say the Ark of the Covenant will be seen above the cloud as we're defending Jerusalem. Once you understand 2 Samuel chapter 6 and how the Ark of the Covenant was finally uh, made it to the city of David, Father and King David had a special moment and they rejoiced like you wouldn't believe. And it was a private party between King David and the Lord. And King David danced whirlwind movements mightily with all his might, whirlwind after whirlwind after whirlwind. And that's exactly what we read in Father's Word about the day of the Lord's return. That multiple whirlwinds will go forth throughout the land and chase and rebuke the enemy out of the land on the day of the Lord's return. Understand the character of your father. Read 2 Samuel chapter 6. That's what's happening when Jesus returns. So, we'll end this with the subtracting seven years from these years. Help me out with the math. Oh, don't let me mess this up. All right, what would that be? Seven years from 2025 would be, what, 2018? And seven years from 2028 would be 2021 for the start of the tribulation. But trib start. Now, do we have any cosmic signs scheduled during that time frame? Any known, scheduled, known by NASA, special signs in the heavens and the stars during this period? Well, we do have on, I'll put it over here. I think it's, I could be wrong, 23 September 2017. A once in a lifetime, once in every 7,000 years cosmic event is going to happen. 
you can look it up on YouTube. Uh, a brother by the name of Mark Chiswell. I think he goes by the handle, what, Chizza7 on YouTube. Has an awesome, awesome presentation on that event on 23 September 2017. A special alignment that only happens once every thousand years or so. Where you have... Uh, 12 stars above the head of the Virgin, Constellation Virgo. You've got the Constellation Leo above her head, consists of nine stars. There'll be three planets that uh, along with the Constellation Leo will be a total of 12 bright lights you'll see above the head of the Virgin, Constellation Virgo. That she'll be clothed in the sun, the moon under her feet. All right, and you're gonna have Jupiter inside the quadrangle of the constellation Virgo for nine and a half months and then it exits on this date 23 September 2017 Jupiter comes out of the quadrangle of the constellation Virgo don't know if it means anything but remember astronomy is different from astrology keep that in mind interesting but oh as far as the month of our Lord's return look at Isaiah chapter 18 he comes back to cut down and cut off the abominable branches twigs sprigs you name it a couple weeks before the annual grape harvest in Israel we're talking about the month of Av in the summer which actually matches that 2 August 20, 2027 date which I find that kind of fascinating not a date setter I'd be wasting my time if I tried to set a date but I personally believe the Lord meant what he said in Hosea 6 2 now did it say to start the third day or did it say on the third day it said on the third day I'll admit that but he said his going forth is established just like the morning In other words, Father determined before the foundations of the earth when he was putting the stars and the sun in motion, he determined the day that Jesus would return to set up the kingdom of God and in what manner he would do it. As far as I can tell, Israel has to rebuild their temple. It hasn't started yet. I admit it. We're all watching to see if that happens. Uh, when will the uh, caliphate turn into a beast kingdom? Daniel 11 says it's going to happen at what's known as the time of the end. In Daniel 11 is going to happen after the Antichrist has gone into the temple twice. Fifth seal and sixth seal. Daniel 11 also says in verse 40 that the event that will kick off the time of the end is when uh, Egypt and its confederation of northern and central African nations are going to go up to the river Euphrates and do battle once and for all with the king of the north. They'll fight many times during the tribulation, but the final battle will be at the time of the end. Daniel 11 verse 40. and Egypt will be totally defeated. There'll be bodies upon bodies upon bodies. The big sacrifice by the great river Euphrates in Iraq. That's what's going to kick off the time of the end. Now my question is, when does the time of the end start? Does that signify the sixth trumpet? Does it signify the seventh seal? Does it signify that it happens immediately after the Antichrist goes into the temple the second time at the sixth seal? I'm not 100% sure on that. I am trying to work out those details now. We do know that the siege of Jerusalem will again happen and it again will last 430 days because those verses are worded that talk about the siege of Jerusalem in Ezekiel chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7 
in such a manner as to lead you to believe that those scriptures are talking about the last days, the time of the latter rain, the last day of the age. Therefore, again, the siege of Jerusalem will be 430 days again. Who saves them? Well, Jesus and his army comes back, according to Zechariah 14, at the moment that 50% uh, of Jerusalem has already been taken captive. Zechariah 13 says that two out of every three people in the land of Israel outside of Jerusalem will be dead at the time of our Lord's return. The other third father will bring through the fire and refine them. That means they'll be tested. That does not mean they'll live. That means they'll be tested by the mark. Two thirds will die from war. The other third get tested and refined. Does that mean a third of Israel will 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 die from the mark of the beast test i don't know the percentage so probably some will some won't but they're going to be tested it's all there in father's word brothers and sisters this should be your number one form of entertainment he wants you to spend time in his word he doesn't want you to be a false prophet he i think he wants you to be a date setter as long as you word it that and let people know who are listening to you that you don't have an idea when he's coming back. But look what I found as clues in Father's Word. If you word it like that, it's a good thing. If what you say whets their appetite so they get into Father's Word, that's a good thing. But those who believe in the pre-trib rapture and says that he could come back at any time, that is from the devil. That is not true. It is not true. He does not come twice. There's not a secret rapture and then a return of the Lord on the last day of the age to do battle. And then everyone points out 1 Thessalonians where it says we're not appointed to wrath. What they don't understand is in the first chapter of the next letter to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, it explains what wrath is that he was talking about at the end of 1 Thessalonians. He's talking about the wrath when he comes, the sword of his mouth, the plague in Zechariah 14, 12, that he uses to cut down the abominable branches. That's the wrath he's talking about. There's multiple types of father's wrath. Did you know that? There's the 42-month uh, period, authority of the Antichrist over the saints, that is a wrath which you have the trumpet and bowls that occur during that time the trumpet judgments on Israel primarily and then the bowls of wrath poured out onto those trapped in the pit in the valley of Armageddon for that 45 day period where the sixth bowl is uh, three unclean spirits are busy trying to gather all the remaining nations representatives and militaries uh, armies to, uh, to, the, to the wedding hall that's the first wrath. Jesus comes back. The plague of Zechariah 14.12 to cut down the abominable branches is the second form of wrath. This is the one that we are not appointed to. Why? Because the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, those in Christ will be glorified and up on the sea of glass, standing on the sea of glass, singing the song of the Lamb, the song of Moses. Then the handed a bow of bronze they go to war that takes place on the last day of the age but the third type of wrath is the great white throne judgment when all will be resurrected and most humans will face a second death think about that the vast majority of humans of all time will face a second death because they're going to be raised from the dead and given a glorified body. Is it for seconds? Is it for minutes? Is it for days that they're under trial? And you have to give an account for everything? I don't know. But again, we are not appointed to Father's wrath. We're not appointed to the second death wrath at the great white throne judgment. We're not appointed to Zechariah 14.12 the method that Jesus uses upon his return to cut down the abominable branches, but you are appointed to be overcome. Uh, you are, let me rephrase that. You are appointed to suffer afflictions, trials, 
and persecutions, and those of us who are alive during the seven year tribulations, many, many, many of us will die. You're appointed to that. Read Matthew 24. He tells you at early parts of Matthew 24. You're going to suffer trials, persecutions, and many of you are going to die. Israel is appointed to be in Israel during the trumpet judgments. Now, what happens to Israel? This is what I was trying to remember. What happens to Israel if they did not take the mark of the beast, but they are not in Christ at Christ's return? What happens to them? Well, if they're part of the one-third of Israel, Zechariah 13, that do not die during the war, then they will have to suffer the mark of the beast test. Did you catch that? What happens if they pass the test? That means they're beheaded. That's why you see the key phrase, refine them. That means you are made white. You are given that uh, white linen because you gave the correct answer. I will not deny the one and only true Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now what about the 50% of Jerusalem in Zechariah 14 that have not been taken captive uh, many of them will be left alive what happens to them they didn't take the mark they're not in Christ when he when he returns once he returns they call upon the name of the Lord what happens to them Zechariah 14 Jesus jumps off his chariot that you read about in Ezekiel chapter 1 he jumps off the chariot that's riding that supercell storm cloud stands on the Mount of Olives splits it in half those 10% uh, of the inhabitants of Jerusalem go through the Mountain Valley Pass they didn't have the mark they weren't in Christ they call upon the name of Jesus they realize their mistake they realize their father's mistake and they get escorted over to Bethany three miles east of the Mount of Olives just before Jesus lets that plague of Zechariah 14 12 out of his mouth and they turn into pillars of salt where they stand so pre-tribulation is not true mid-trib pre-wrath brothers where you went wrong was you didn't understand Isaiah chapter 13 the 42 month period has bookends. All right? Bookends. There's going to be earthquakes at the sixth seal. There's going to be earth, the greatest earthquake of all time at the seventh bowl. All right? There's wrath and there's fierce anger. But when Paul was talking about we're not appointed to wrath, he meant Zechariah 14 12. He meant what you find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 is the wrath of the Lord of hosts. When Jesus returns and cuts down the abominable branches. That's a key phrase. Watch for that all throughout scripture. Cut off or cut down. He's talking about the abominable branches mentioned in Isaiah 18. Which also again gives the month of our Lord's return. The Hebrew month of Av. Understand the basics to the latter days and... Once you do, you can't put the Bible down. Every time you read something in Malachi, Micah, Hosea, Amos, Joel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, the, every time you read a verse, you will go, I know where that verse is in five other places in the Bible. Then you'll be turning to Psalms 90, Psalm 18, Book of Revelation, Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians. It really, really becomes fun. And you go, and then your Bible is going to look like mine. You're going to have 10 Bible verses written on every Bible verse. You're going to know where to find this stuff. Again, this desire was given to me. I'm, I have not been given all understanding yet. You know, I'm just an old country boy. I'm not real bright. <laughs> My family will attest to that. And I don't claim to know everything. But I've been given some stuff, and I'm going to be held accountable if I don't give it to you. Brothers and sisters, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I hope it's been a blessing. I can't wait to see you next time. God bless.